Kicking off the list at number 10, left arm issues. Since Iron Man 1, Tony's left arm hasn't gotten a break. When Tony makes his first flight escaping the 10 rings, a tank shoots him out of the sky, hitting his left arm. In Iron Man 2, he gets electrocuted by whiplash and his tech shows that his left arm is in the red. It's not looking good. Iron Man 3, Tony uses snow to soothe his arm after crash landing, so it must be still hurting. In Civil War, Tony literally says to Nat, my left arm is numb, is that normal? Cut to an hour later, Tony's arm is even in more pain and now in a sling after Wanda dropped a car on it. Even in Spider-Man Homecoming, he's supporting his arm whilst giving Peter a lecture on being a superhero. Makes sense why he snapped with his right hand. Left one's probably done. He probably has no nerves left. Number 10, her original costume. Black Widow's original costume before her black cat suit, but after her more casual spy in a dress look, was definitely not worthy of Natasha's fearsome presence. Originally in the comics, Black Widow was a villain, and this outfit made her look kind Kinda like a C-class one at best. The one-piece bodysuit and mask I don't mind as much, though a small bodysuit does seem kinda impractical for a human who spies and likely doesn't want to expose skin to getting nicked or hurt or shot at. Still, the worst part of the look by far was the full body fishnet that she wore underneath. Obviously fishnet doesn't cover very much and it just looks gaudy and that seems like something that would catch your eye as well as opposed to lending to stealth. Add in her her cape and her B earrings and W cape clasp and you've got one eyesore of a look. Thankfully, Black Widow would concede that she needed something way more durable and would move from this look to her more signature all black ensemble. Number 9, Hawkeye kills her. Really, just the Ultimate Universe has been pretty awful to Black Widow, but one of the worst moments for her here is when she is killed point blank by Hawkeye. Granted, at least she kinda deserved her death here, but did Black Widow deserve such a dark story in general? Probably not. Clint comes for revenge because here Natasha is a traitor who basically was responsible for the death of his family and his own capture besides. Escaping capture, he gets free and rushes to where Black Widow is being held as Tony already apprehended her. He then basically executes her while she is in custody at the hospital. It's all pretty dark and very much Ultimate Universe-esque, and not necessarily in the good way. Picking off the list at number 10, Smacked by Thanos. We got to see Captain America and many others get the beatdown of their lives in Avengers Infinity War, but in the comic, in Infinity Gauntlet, it was somehow even more brutal. Yet in part four of Jim Starlin's The Infinity Gauntlet, Thanos at one point weakens himself while maintaining the stones because he wanted to take on the Avengers in a more equal fight. All of this just to impress death. So he makes himself weak and then fist fights them. It's crazy. So Captain America is leading the Avengers into battle and at this point, everybody is getting hit. Cyclops gets his head stuck in a clear block of force. Vision gets his insides just torn out. And then Thanos sees Cap as having such an emotional outburst. And then after Thanos destroys Cap's shield, he gives him the mighty backhand of a lifetime, knocking him out cold. And before we continue on to number nine, guys, if you could just go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, because it really goes a long way for us here at the studio. You guys are the best, thank you so much. Now back to the video. Number nine, he lost Bucky. Okay, 2005 was a wild time. We got to see Jason Todd return as the Red Hood and Marvel had their own type of super sleeper assassin come back from the dead as well, Bucky Barnes. In 2005, Bucky Barnes returned, but of course he was never the same. Near the end of World War II, Bucky and Cap were trying to disarm a bomb on a plane while taking down Baron Zemo. The bomb went off, hurling Steve and Bucky into the freezing waters, and well, as for Cap, he came out of this pretty good. He remained frozen, just hanging out, and Bucky, he didn't end up so lucky. His body fell into the freezing waters, and at the time, a Soviet spy submarine was in the area crossing the English Channel. So they scooped him up, fixed the whole left arm situation, brainwashed him, and turned him into this brutal assassin. It's heartbreaking. See, he has all these incredible abilities that make him a fierce warrior, but he doesn't remember how he got them, making him this deadly assassin and a super crazy villain to handle. This is Steve's right-hand man. Every conflict that they go through is just painful. One of the biggest turning points of Marvel was the introduction of the Winter Soldier. This was a conflict that came to life on the big screen back in 2014 with the Winter Soldier, and we're kind of still seeing Bucky try and figure this life out. With the Falcon and the Winter Soldier coming next month on Disney+, Plus, we can see even more of what he has to go through post-Winter Soldier times. Number 8, Hail Hydra. This next one resulted in writer Nick Spencer getting death threats. That's right, so fans were mostly not okay with this one. Back in 2016, Captain America said two words that would throw every comic book fan for a loop. Hail Hydra. 
It all went down in 2017 Secret Wars, when Captain America's reality had been rewritten secretly by Kobik, who was a sentient cosmic cube acting under the influence of the Red Skull. So as a child, Steve was recruited and raised to believe in their ideology, which was the strong ruling for the weak, for the good of all. Now there's a pleasant nod to this in Avengers Endgame, of course, when the team goes back in time to the first Avengers plot. We see Steve get in the elevator to try and get the scepter, and then we see the whole Hydra slash shield elevator stocked full of guys. Now we don't know this at the time, but that's fully Hydra, but Steve knows this. So instead of beating everybody up and kicking ass in the elevator like he did in Winter Soldier, he just said, hail Hydra. And then just like that, he walked out of the elevator with a smirk on his face. It was beautiful. Number seven, Old Man Cap. At the end of Avengers Endgame, now that we're talking about it, we see Captain America return the Infinity Stones, only he doesn't shoot back to the present day after he's done. No, he sticks around, hangs out with Peggy, dances the night away, and then we see him as an old man giving the shield down to Sam Wilson just minutes later. It's a lovely end to Chris Evans' run on the character. You got a lot of feels. But in the comics, we also saw an old Captain America, but this time, it wasn't on his terms. The Iron Nail sucked all of Cap's serum out, leaving him not ripped, but also not young as well. So now Steve looked 90, and there's no way you're gonna fight at that age, let alone pick up a shield. So he would lead the Avengers and call out orders from the radio. It sounds like a pretty sweet job for us, but for Steve, he's probably like, man, this is the most boring job I've had in my entire life. Number six. William Nasland. He was originally introduced in the comics as the Spirit of 76 in Invaders issue 14. William Asland also held Captain America's mantle for a brief moment. This what if comic turned out to be canon. So back after the apparent death of Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes at the end of World War II, the United States approached him to be the new Captain America. The first replacement. Wow, how exciting would that be? So much pressure though. So he had the shield for a brief amount of time. He had done a couple of missions and then he died in action. Yeah, he had to fight off these robots and he ended up in the hands of one of them and was crushed to death. But he went down a hero. He activated a flare device that made the robot inactive and he also summoned the other members of the All Winners to come to the rescue. So he went out a hero, short but sweet. Number five. William Burnside. William Burnside, who had changed his name to Steve Rogers and even got work done on his face to match the look. He ended up developing another Captain America serum and he and his buddy Jack tried to be the new Bucky and Cap. So they got enhanced abilities and they took down Red Skull. They did some pretty good work as a team. The only thing was a year later, things started to go a little bit south. They started to become paranoid schizophrenics. So the government put them in chirogenic suspension. He went from being Captain America to being the villain, just like that. So William and his Bucky Barnes sidekick, Jack Monroe, both were in custody of Dr. Faustus, who brainwashed William to become the Grand Director, the leader of the hate group called the National Force. Number eight, guilt. One of the worst things to happen to Black Widow, both in the comics and in the MCU, seems to be her own actions. A lot of the time, all of that red in her ledger seems to be one of the biggest things when it comes to her own suffering. In the comics, Black Widow has even set out before on missions to atone for her past misdeeds and sins. But to her, I don't think really any of her actions no matter how grand or how many of them will ever really be great enough to let her forgive herself. She seems to struggle with the concepts of self-acceptance and self-forgiveness quite a lot. Perhaps this is what makes her character so relatable for so many of us, but this is also what makes a lot of her life as a hero feel pretty tragic. The fact that she is on what feels like a never-ending journey for atonement. Number seven, her relationship with Daredevil. I know there are lots of people that ship Black Widow and Daredevil heartily, and based on their stories in more modern comics, I get it. But if we go back into the dark history of their relationship in comics, it gets really really weird. The moments from way back when Natasha and Matt were first dating did not age well and just make Daredevil look like a creep and Black Widow kind of look like his like sad doormat. There are actually a lot of things about Daredevil comics that are really to me just plain weird from everyone constantly reminding Matt that he's blind to his extremely chauvinistic behavior towards Natasha. I also love that Natasha even calls him out for it but then just like, still just goes along with it. Number six, MCU death. A lot of people have criticized the treatment of Black Widow's character in general in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but one of the worst things was when Black Widow was killed off during Endgame. Black Widow went out nobly, of course, but everyone was left wondering why she had to be so permanently gone. Like, why was Black Widow the one we lost, huh? What's more, the worst part about this whole endeavor is that while Tony Stark got a big funeral and huge acknowledgement of his sacrifice by the end of the movie, hey, it feels as though Natasha's sacrifice has been all but forgotten at the end of that movie. The most she gets in her memory is angry Hulk, like, throwing a bench and Hawkeye just looking real sad. 
Nice. Granted, it does seem more likely based on film rumors that it might actually not be the true end for Natasha as there have been rumors that after her solo film, Scarlett Johansson will actually be making some kind of return as, I don't know, that character or a clone. But at this point, it's all still speculative. So I'm still pretty upset about her death. Number five, relationship with Iron Man. Back to the ultimate universe we go. Another awful point when it came to Black Widow's characterization in this alternate universe was that she was paired up with Tony Stark. Well, actually, it isn't even so much that part that I take issue with, but more the fact that she was manipulating him the entire time. Needless to say, this relationship did not end well for either party. As you know, Black Widow ended up being apprehended and later killed, whereas Tony was later reminded of Natasha in a very public way when a certain tape of theirs was circulated publicly. If you haven't already been able to tell, I'm not a huge fan of this part of the Ultimate Universe. Don't get me wrong, there are a lot of cool things that came out of that line and came out of that world, but this is definitely not one of them for me. Number four, manipulated into joining the KGB. After Natasha learned her husband Alexei went missing in action, she was inspired to serve her country by his sacrifice. With Alexei being believed dead, Natasha joined the KGB and became one of their best operatives and spies. In reality, Alexei was not actually dead, but the decision was made to tell Natasha that he was, separating the two after their marriage because, well, the government believed that it was in their best interest to do so when it came to utilizing both of these agents more efficiently. Which is kind of weird because I think they also kind of incentivized them to get married, so... Number three, blackmailed into becoming a spy. Not only was Black Widow manipulated into joining the KGB, but even before that, she had actually been blackmailed into becoming a spy for her own country, who threatened her husband's life if she didn't cooperate with them. Yeah, this whole thing's pretty messed up. And that is one of the ways her life as a spy began. And I say one of the ways because, well, Black Widow's life is kind of complicated when it comes to uncovering her true origins. But this, as one of them, is a pretty tragic one. Basically, Natasha's marriage to Alexei, and even in fact, her other marriages, were one of the ways that her country manipulated her and then also controlled her, making her do their bidding. Number two, retcons on retcons. Speaking of her convoluted origins, Black Widow is a character who has also suffered from retcons on retcons when it comes to her true origin story. Initially, we knew her as a ballerina turned spy. What a strange story. But we would later learn that her ballerina backstory was all a lie and that in fact all her memories that she had as a ballerina were actually implanted and fake. This was all part of a plot of the Red Room to basically make Natasha believe this was her backstory and like manipulate and control her when she was really being trained by them instead. Not only does this add even more to the number of times and ways in which Natasha was manipulated, blackmailed, and brainwashed, but it also just adds to our confusion when it comes to actually trying to keep track of her backstory and getting it straight. It's like, oh, it was this, but then that was actually all fakes, and it was this, but then that was fake. Number one, clones. One of the worst things to happen to any character, really. As if it wasn't enough, the Red Room played with Natasha's emotions and manipulated her mind more than once. They also decided to make copies of her and other agents as well. That's right, Natasha also at one point had a ton of clones made in her image. In the end, though, she destroyed the Red Room's clones of her taking back her own persona and causing a whole lot of grief for the Red Room in the end. Thank goodness. Still, having someone clone you without your permission is pretty awful, and in my book is one of the worst things that can happen to a character. Not anti-clones, just as they exist, but I'm, I'm anti-cloning, I guess. Number nine, killed by Captain America. Tony and his tech are pretty close, but in Age of X story, we see the two get a little too close for comfort. After a virus began taking its toll on Tony, he started to literally merge into his armor. That's like something from Black Mirror, that sounds horrible. He decided that a name change was also in order, so he started going by Steel Corpse, which, gotta say, looking at him is much more fitting. He, alongside other much livelier Avengers, headed out to take down some mutants. But upon arrival in superhero fashion, they changed their mind and opted to help everybody else instead. We love a change of heart. Nice. Only Tony's advanced suit wasn't exactly on board. So now we have a situation. Tony implored Cap to save them, and at that moment, there was really only one way Cap could do it. R.I.P. Tony. Number eight, punched by Captain Marvel. 
Avengers Endgame showed Tony being saved by Captain Marvel when he was stuck in deep space. But in Civil War 2, they aren't exactly pals. When the inhuman Ulysses Kane starts to divide the superhero community, they get off on the wrong foot. Ulysses has this ability where he can predict possible futures, and in one of those visions, he saw a catastrophe. Captain Marvel wanted to act on this. We can literally see the future. What a way to have the upper hand, right? But Tony, he wasn't on board. He was concerned about the fact that nobody really knew exactly how Kane's powers were working. That was one thing. But to punish somebody else over something they may do in the future, well, it feels morally wrong. When Spider-Man and Captain America travel to Washington to seek out a possible vision, conflict does in fact arise. It's Civil War II, you gotta remember that. So Tony gets punched so hard by Captain Marvel that he falls into a coma. Yikes. Number seven, Endgame Sacrifice. Of course, the worst things that happened to MCU Tony is also one of the best things that happened to the universe. After five years of half the population missing, Tony agrees to work out a time heist with the remaining Avengers, and when they get back with the stones, Sans Natasha, Thanos is waiting there too. Tony didn't take the stones and fly away, no, instead he snapped his own fingers and wiped out Thanos and his army. Of course, mirroring the ending of the first Iron Man film, reminding us he is in fact Iron Man. It was a great moment, but I knew Tony was gonna die. But to see him do it in this way felt so fitting. I shed a little drop of sadness in the theater. Maybe a few or five. I couldn't stop crying. Number six, paralyzed. Kathleen Dare made her first appearance in Marvel Comics with Iron Man issue 233. She was this fun, loving young woman who fell for Tony Stark, but unfortunately she was psychologically unstable, so that love turned into something more sinister. Later on in Iron Man 242, Kathleen shot Tony and in turn, he was paralyzed. The injury damaged Tony's spine quite a bit. He wasn't even sure if he would ever walk again. Tony Stark is quite dramatic. He likes to put on a show, we know this. And in Iron Man issue 284, he reveals his biggest trick yet. The cover shows Tony Stark laying in a casket with the text underneath reading, The Death of Anthony Stark. Huh, what? Around him are other superheroes. They're mourning the loss of their friend and fellow Avenger. Like in Avengers Endgame, everybody shows up. Even Doctor Doom, he proposes a toast in honor of a worthy opponent who has fallen. But Tony is always prepared, even after death. He had written a note to Rhodey previously, and the note mentions a key card that would give him access to the entire complex in the form of a CD. I got Tony Stark's secrets and Big Shiny Tune 6. What are we feeling today, folks? Rhodey collects himself, puts in the CD, and clicks play. It's a dream scenario, really. Tony explains to Rhodey that the world still needs Iron Man, and then you see a suit made specifically for Rhodey. What a moment. Again, it mirrors Tony's final holograph message in the MCU, a powerful moment on screen and on page. So Rhodey was stressing. There was so much responsibility bestowed upon him, all the while he's trying to mourn the loss of a close friend. That's a loaded day. So finally, he suits up and it's a blast. Iron Man lives again. Nice. Turns out Tony wasn't actually dead at all, rather just under chirogenic stasis until a scientist sorted out those back problems. Invincible Iron Man, you don't say. Number five, trick shot to the heart. Dark Avengers issue 190. In the alternate Earth of 13584, we see a pocket reality where Tony has undergone a pretty drastic upgrade, if you wanna call it an upgrade, of course. He's still Iron Man, only he's evil this time around, and he's also just a brain. Yeah, this is a dark future where New York is the only remaining part of civilization, so the Dark Avengers are fighting over it. When Janet Van Dyne crushes Iron Man, he ejects out of the suit, again, just a brain, just rolls on out, and at that moment, Clint's brother, Barty Barton, shoots right through the brain with an arrow. At least it was a quick way to go this time around. Number four, hit by a plane. Marvel's Dark Ages arc featured a pretty rare injury for Tony to endure, considering that he can fly and he's also wrapped in metal. The timing here is just so unfortunate. The story kicks off with an earthquake. Tony tells Pepper to take cover as he tries to figure out a super solution. Shortly after, there's power cuts, classic earthquake move. So now Pepper is stuck in an elevator and Tony's distress calls aren't even going through to the Avengers. Even his suit powers down mid-flight. On the way down, Tony's flailing about when a passing plane hits him and cuts off his left foot. The plane crashes down on the ground and Tony, while losing quite a bit of blood, crashes into Stark Towers. Number three, lost the kid. We had an idea of how Infinity War would end. We knew part two was a year afterwards, so we knew somebody was biting the dust. Well, half of our beloved heroes ended up turning into dust, including the young Peter Parker. Tom Holland knocked this out of the park. I don't cry in movies often, but when Peter was telling Tony that he didn't want to go, 
Holy shit. This was Tony's final arc, moving to the woods, having a kid, just dropped the superhero life right away. And even when Scott, Steve, and Natasha showed up to offer a possible solution, Tony doesn't even want to be involved. He says he's got a second chance right here, referring to Morgan and Pepper. Losing Spider-Man, Tony felt responsible. He made the kid the suit that allowed him to even go to space in the first place, and then all of a sudden he's a pile of dust all over your lap. Yeah, that would mess me up for five years as well. You don't blame him. Number two, Armor Wars. The Armor Wars series is confirmed to hit Disney Disney Plus sometime down the road with Don Cheadle attached to the project, so we figured we'd remind you how the comics went. It's just a blast. Armor Wars is a seven issue series written by David Michelinie and Bob Layton. Now after Iron Man's tech was stolen, Tony was on the hunt to take down several villains using any sort of armor or tech. He's taken down anybody with armor. He even fights fellow Avenger Stingray at one point, although he's innocent. I hope we get that fun introduction in live action, that would be... Crisp. When Iron Man battled firepower, he got injured so badly that he faked his own death. See, in the comics at this time, the world didn't know that Iron Man was Tony Stark. They thought it was Tony's bodyguard, a guy named Randall Pierce. So Tony ended up becoming the new Iron Man, although he took all of those punches before anonymously. And finally, number one, Infinity Gauntlet. Just because the Infinity Gauntlet can undo things doesn't mean we can forget about them. Like that time in the comics when Iron Man got his head ripped off by Taraxia. The Infinity Gauntlet was a six part series that began in 1991 from the brilliant Jim Starlin and George Perez. It opens with Silver Surfer crashing down into Earth, saying that Thanos is coming. And come issue four, the Avengers are now going to Thanos. The plan was for the Avengers to attack Thanos and his new partner, Taraxia. Meanwhile, Silver Surfer was waiting around on deck to snatch that Infinity Gauntlet. Sounds easier said than done. Thanos stops Thor's hammers with his fingertips. Wolverine's adamantium bones turn to rubber. So gross. Cyclops gets his head stuck in a clear block of force. Vision gets the life literally ripped out of him. And Iron Man gets dispatched, as Taraxia says, whilst holding Tony's head proudly. Like it's a birthday cake. She's like, here you go, Thanos. Here's a head. Things get undone later on, but that one shot of everybody just laying there, it's gonna live in my head rent free. Number four, 404. Cap not found. In Captain America issue 404, we see Steve Rogers squaring up against werewolves. Yeah, what a sight to see. You heard me correctly. I said werewolves. The story known as Children of the Night runs from issue 403 to 405. And during this time, Captain America is fighting off Starksboro werewolves. And then when Nightshade tries to inject Wolverine with her wolf serum, his healing factor keeps counteracting him. So Druid mesmerized him with serums too. Then the next issue we see front and center, Cap Wolf. Pretty hard to forget. So now he's a werewolf and he has faint memories of Steve Rogers. So, of course, as you would expect, it's a pretty messy good time. Number three, Civil War. Captain America Civil War was released in 2016, directed by the Russo brothers. And the whole movie, like the comic, is superhero politics. If you're a superhero, you have to register. You can't just be out filming yourself doing super TikToks and then you end up accidentally exploding a school. It's just not gonna fly anymore. And in the movie, it's Wanda Maximoff who kickstarts the Sokovia Accords, forcing Tony to side with the government as he feels responsible for Charles Spencer, among many others' deaths. You know, with all the events that unfold with the Age of Ultron stuff. So Steve wants to protect Bucky this whole time, and of course, freedom throughout the team is encouraged. Now, eventually, due to Baron Zemo's work, he gets Tony in the same room as Steve, and we see footage of a brainwashed Bucky kill Tony's parents. The next 10 minutes are filled with Steve having to fight off Tony in order to save his best friend. And it's truly heartbreaking, and it all ends with Steve sticking the shield in Tony's chest, and as he carries away a broken down Winter Soldier, Tony says to him the shield does not belong to him, belongs to his father. And that's the last time he sees the shield and Tony Stark, so it all goes downhill for Cap for quite a while after this point. Number two, stuck in Dimension Z. In the comic storyline, Castaway in Dimension Z, Captain America ends up getting stuck in this land created by Arnim Zola. And he's in there for 12 years. That's some Black Mirror type torture. That's like crazy. So during the 12 years, Steve raised a boy named Ian, who's a kid he rescued from Zola as his own. So the whole thing is that Steve has to return to Earth soon before this implant on his torso that's combined with the virus of Zola's consciousness takes over his mind. Not a great scenario. Also, ouch, that doesn't look too comfortable of a procedure. It's one of the more brutal body injuries and of course the whole being trapped for 12 years element. I mean, that just adds to this already horrible nightmare. And finally, number one, shot by Sharon Carter. We go back now to the Civil War comic book event where Captain America was killed by his girlfriend, Sharon Carter. Yeah, so after Crossbones sniped him, Agent 13, who at the time was Cap's girlfriend, 
delivered the final bullet from a much, much closer range. Well, it turns out it wasn't Sharon who was doing the work, really. The classic brainwashing made this defeat happen. Dr. Faustus. Okay, this causes a whole chain of events. I mean, for starters, Bucky decides he should then kill Iron Man after this, blaming him for the death of Steve Rogers. And then also, Falcon ends up going after his own lead. He just leaves. And now, Tony ended up showing Bucky the letter Cap wrote about how he should be the next Captain America. And Bucky agrees to take the spot only if he can operate solo. No government no big brother watching, just let me do my job, move out of the way, you guys suck. To think all this came to a climax after Steve's girlfriend was the one to deliver that final blow just adds insult to injury.